What's up, my friends? Welcome back to The Home Slice. Now, some of you may have been following along with some of my survival sharpening episodes, and we've covered quite a lot of experimental ground. So I'm going to attempt in this episode to summarize my findings about everything thus far. Now, my disclaimer, my first disclaimer on that is that I'm not going to put a time limit on this video. I have no idea how long it will end up being, but I'm going to try to move along efficiently. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, a few years ago, I had this idea to test out this theory that many of us have that we say 1095 steel would be the best steel to have in a survival knife because if you were stranded alone, abandoned, whatever, forgot your sharpening stone out in the woods, it would be the easiest thing to sharpen on the sorts of materials that you would find out there, i.e. that it would be the easiest to sharpen on an actual rock as opposed to some form of whetstone or pocket stone. One day I decided it would be easy to test a hypothesis that's based on the fact that you don't have anything because you don't have to have anything other than 1095 and other steel to test it. So I set off for a nearby river with my K-Bar Becker BK7 and a Benchmaden S30V and a Spyderco in H1 to find a rock in the river, to sharpen all three blades on it, and to test the best reading, which is the apex keenness measurement on each of the knives to see which one actually took the best edge. Now the big takeaway from that test was basically that the carbon steel and the stainless steel, that is the low alloy or more malleable steels like 1095 and H1 actually sharpened very similarly. The 1095 did win in that, which was an interesting result by a few grams on the best machine. And that was sort of the takeaway that I had from episode one. It was kind of fun. It was a bit of an adventure going out into the woods and doing something. I had a lot of fun filming it, but it kicked off this thought process for me. If you want to check out that video, I'll put a link here. Episodes two and three of the survival sharpening series or process that I went on, I had gathered a lot more stones from a lot of different locations. And rather than going out into the field where I found it was hard to set the best machine on anything, it was hard to find any surface where I could sit down, which would be the case out in survival sharpening. But at the same time, I thought if I'm going to move efficiently through these and minimize variables, like minimize my own errors, I think I'm going to need to take these stones back, soak them in water at home and do home testing to sort of give a fair chance to each kind of stone and each kind of steel to try to isolate those variables a little bit closer. In episode two, I collected a whole bunch of coarse stones and I tested which of those created the best sharpness reading on my best machine on very basic steel. In the next episode, episode three, I tested out some of the finer textured stones and some pumice and bark and different things that you might be able to use as a stropping mechanism that you would find outdoors. Links to those videos will be up above my head, but the key takeaway that I got from those is that with a larger variety of stones from a collection of different settings, I found that sharp is actually possible on river rocks. Like you can get something to a working edge where my best reading in the first test had plateaued out about 400 grams. Some of the readings that I got in episodes two and three and four started to look like actually sharp, like in the mid 200s and mid 300s on the best machine, which was really cool. That brings us to episode four. In episode four, I took the best coarse and fine stones, the best stropping sort of mechanisms or mediums that I found, which happened to be some river rocks and some bark. And I tested them out on three different kinds of steel. One of them was a 1095 analog made by Opinel. One of them was 8CR13 MOV by SOG. And one of them was purportedly D2 on a budget knife I got on Amazon by a brand called Ethan Grow or some really difficult to pronounce thing like that. My big takeaway from this episode was that I did see a really marked, like a really large difference in doing the same thing to different steels and having brought them indoors and sort of isolated the movements and given myself a flat surface to work with. Different steels 
still had vastly different characteristics. This sort of harmonizes with one of the assumptions that you make if you make this argument that 1095 steel is the best because it would sharpen the best on a rock. At least we're seeing evidence that different types and different sort of microstructures and compositions of steel do have different results if you do try to sharpen them in a survival sharpening sort of situation. However, the steel that performed slightly better than the 1095 was this steel that claimed to be D2. And I have to make a correction to the episode here because since then, I have had lots of conversations with guys where they say, hey, like that brand, Ethan Grow, advertises as using D2, but usually people look at them with like spectrometers and things that you can tell the composition of what's actually in the steel, and they discover that it's impossible that they use D2 because the elements that are there don't line up with sort of the alloy recipe that makes up D2. I was told by one viewer that in most of the testing, it looks like that brand often utilizes things like 3CR13, or 5CR15, these Chinese steels that are sort of stainless, but they have this low alloy amount within them. That sort of lines up with the fact that H1, which is also a very, very low alloy stainless, had the sort of ductility and the sort of characteristics to form an effective working edge using just rocks that are not processed by man and just found out in nature. On a note there, all of my tests, the rules that I have sort of used to guide myself in terms of what I can grab and not grab is I don't grab any stones that are in an area where it's clear that they've been quarried. I don't grab stones from driveways, roadways, uh, any of those things. I only grab rocks out on hikes or out at the beach where it's very, very clear that nothing has been done to process, to flatten, to shape, anything like that. So it's something that you could find in a non-populated area that is in its natural state. I don't do anything to process the rocks after that. I don't take my diamond stone and flatten them. The only thing that I do with any of these rocks is I get them wet and rub them against each other to try to make them more flat for the sharpening process because that's something you could do in the field as long as you had more than one rock, which usually if you can find one, you can find more than one. So I've tried to keep that sort of as pure as possible, not done anything to have a man-made effect on the materials that I'm using, but really be true and fair to the idea that you're finding these things abroad and what can you do when you have no gear. Because of the error that was in that regarding D2 and because I can only do five links in a video on YouTube and because of the fact that I did another steel test later that I think was much higher caliber and quality than the one I just mentioned, I'm not going to link that one, but stay tuned for another steel test that I think is more worth heating with better steels anyway for a survival situation in my opinion. Moving on to episode five, I had this question in my mind. I know that testing has been done to establish what is the charpy toughness of different steels. Like if you take a plate of steel and swing a hammer through it on a charpy machine and take the reading of how much force it took to break it, how tough, how fracture resistant are different kinds of steel. I know also that catcher testing has been done on almost any steel you can imagine, where they take these papers that have silicon dust in them and cut them until the knife is dull and the catcher machine tests how difficult that is, how much force it takes to cut through those. And then you test the knife to a certain plateau and you take a reading of how many millimeters of that paper media was cut. I also know that very good rust resistance testing has been done by different people. But the idea that was in my mind is that I don't know that I've seen any testing that's been done in a standardized way in terms of cutting or impact testing the edges that certain steels take when the thing that they are cutting is primarily wood. In my experience, in my mind, the things that you would need to cut in a survival scenario most of the time would come from nature, would come from plants or natural features or things that are growing, i.e. wood. You're going to be processing wood to make your fires. Most likely in most situations, you are going to be building your housing, your furniture, oftentimes out of something that's strong enough to do that, which is going to be fibrous plants or wood most of the time. 
And so I thought it would be interesting because I think that 1095 is, is pretty good for chopping wood in my experience. And so how does that compare to these catcher results that we've seen? Like, because edge retention in a survival situation is not going to be cutting silicon cards. This was my mindset. So on we go to episode five. In episode five, I gathered together eight different types of steel that I thought were compelling options for a survival knife. I had CPM 3V, CPM 10V, CPM S35 VN, SE 1095 steel, Lohman PGK, which is sort of a 1% mid-carbon tool steel that is kind of close to if you tried to make like a ingot version of crewware. It's sort of in that kind of ballpark. I also tested Nitro V and Magnacut and Vanadis 4E. You're sort of like real high impact fine grain structure tough steels. I'll put the numbers that each of these steels and the edges that we had on them hit after 500 strikes with a baton through pine wood. And we'll make some observations about this. Now you should note that the edges were not all sharpened exactly the same, which is to say I've found good results on steels that are low vanadium with my traditional water stones, my aluminum oxide stones, and stropping with Mother's Mag auto polish. So that's what I did for all of the steels that have less than 3% vanadium. All of the steels that have more than 3% vanadium and therefore very, very hard carbides, I sharpened on diamond and stropped on diamond to try to give them the best possible chance of having the toughest edge possible because their carbides would not have been cracked or shattered or mashed, but would have been cut cleanly uh, with finer and finer and finer, progressively finer diamonds down to 0.25 micron stroppy stuff. After the 500 batons, there were sort of three groups present in the testing data that I would divide things into, and that is the knives that ended up in the 100s range of BESS, the 200s range of BESS, and the 300s range of BESS, 300 gram range. So first place went to Magnacut at 63 Rockwell with a reading of 162 and right behind that, what I would call probably a tie because of an average of seven grams difference was Nitro V at 63 Rockwell as well. So those two being the clear winners of this test performed amazingly. 162 and 169 is like still shaving sharp after being hammered through a pine board 500 times. <laughs> Next up we had 10V and 3V which came in just around the 200 mark with actually the 63 Rockwell 10V slightly beating the 3V. I think because it was at a higher hardness. I think the 3V is somewhere around 61, 62 Rockwell and the 10V is from Blank Blades at 63.5. So all of the top performers are in the 63 Rockwell range, which makes an interesting point that oftentimes people think you harden up over 60 Rockwell and you've instantly lost all of your impact. Well, here we have an impact test where 500 times these blades were struck into hardwood timber, the same type of pine board. And our three best contenders were the only three knives that were hardened above 62 Rockwell. Very, very interesting stuff. In the 200s range, we have 3V kind of riding the edge of that, but then right in the middle of that range, we've got SE 1095 and the Lohman PGK steel. I would call these solid middle results, like 231 best from the SE is a good result. It's not the best and it's not among the best in this impact test, but you can totally see why people choose to sharpen 1095. It's easy to sharpen on traditional abrasives and it holds this sharp middle grade edge against wood cutting tasks, which is primarily what you want it for. So good job to SE on that. I, I enjoyed using the SE. It was a joy to work with. Uh, coming in the rear is actually Vanadis 4 Extra. 
uh, and S35VN. The Vanitas 4 didn't do too poorly in this test, but it is surprising that it's so far from 3V and MagnaCut as they are purportedly com comparable in their toughness and structure to it. The last place result was S35VN in an Arno Bernard custom knife. The S35VN at the end of the test was at 385 grams. Admittedly, that's still not needing to be resharpened by the markings on the best scale. They say once it passes 400, you're in need of resharpening. It's close, but it's not a bad result. I would say I was surprised in this test by how good overall the results were and how many different kinds of steel you could actually chop wood with and have the edge last a decent amount of time. That said, when you step back from the test and take a look at the numbers, not incrementally going through, but at the two bookends, the Coastal Camper and the Razor Edge Knives Q in Magna Cut are in that mid 160s range. And that is quite a big difference from 385 in S35VN. So it does make quite a big difference. We see 1095 landing itself in the middle, but then we see some steels which really clearly outperform it in this impact test. Additional observations that I would form here is that the Vanitas 4 is in a zero tolerance knife. Uh, I have had a few zero tolerance knives that I had some difficulty in sharpening and this was years and years ago, but I did find that some of them didn't seem to be at a very high level of hardness. I think ZT builds their knives to be indestructible, so it's understandable if they're rolling at a lower hardness rating, but it is interesting whether that Vanitas 4 be at 58 or 59 or 60 Rockwell, the huge difference you see between that and your 63 Rockwell Magna Cut, your 63 Rockwell Nitro V, or your 62 Rockwell 3V, it's a big performance difference there. The other thing that is of note is that the S35 VN is at an interesting place because it's high in its carbide content, but low in its toughness. Now the 10V has a large amount of alloys in it, but its toughness level is up. And so you see it coming in third place here, which is really interesting and kind of counterintuitive that you would have 10% vanadium, but you could still chop wood third place in this test of eight steels. And then the SE 1095 is in the middle of there and on a Charpy toughness test, it doesn't score super, super high, but it's very low carbide. And so you have this balance where if you go both very high carbide and very low toughness, you're going to start to see worse numbers, it seems to me, just from observing this data in a wood impact situation, where if you go either high toughness or low carbide, you should be all right, it seems to me. Now, as we get to the description of episode six, we'll have a little bit of fun here because episode six, I tried all of the rocks that I've found out on my hikes and out at the beach and all over the place that I've thought, oh, that could be good for survival sharpening. And I've collected this like silly collection of like flat-ish rocks that I'm gonna try to sharpen knives with. And I took all of those and I tried to sharpen the SE6 that was sent to me by a viewer in 1095 steel with every single one of these different rocks. So we're gonna take a look in the microscope at the poorest performing rock, at the one of the middle ones, and the best performing rock, and make some observations on the fly here, okay? So first off, this, I'm starting the microscope up now, and this is a piece of sort of lava rock. I'll show you in the camera. This is what the thing looks like in the camera and you can see it looks pretty flat. You can also see in the microscope that the grain of it looks pretty nice. There's some little crystalline things. It looks like it could have some abrasive qualities and that's pretty nice. But then you'll also see as I come to a part, ooh, it just drops off there. Can you see that? As I adjust the focus, you can see the difference in depth. So there's big kind of shelves and chippy texture. So it looks kind of nice, but then if you start looking at it kind of sideways, there's bumps and ridges. And I think something that I found in this survival sharpening test 
was that it was much more important for you to be able to flatten the rock than it was for it to be hard than it was for it to be fine. Like fineness and hardness were less valuable in the end than just flatness. Moving on to our middle of the road rock. This is a orangish yellowish sort of sedimentary rock. I'll show it to you here. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like in the microscope. And you can see the texture is maybe a little bit more chunky. That sedimentary nature means some of these rocks are like a couple different kinds of rock or whatever that sort of form together. And you can see that the texture looks a bit more coarse. Oh, there's a piece of fabric there. However, you can also see that I've been able to grind this thing flat. Like it's very, very flat. There's a picture of some of the coarse grit that's in there. But then this is a image of how flat it is because I've been able to take another stone and rub that flat where the lava rock was like much too hard, the sedimentary rock flattened out. And I got like a middle of the road result. Lastly, we'll take a look at this guy. This is the piece of shale that I ended up using on all of the eight different steels because it returned the best result. But let's take a look at that in the scope. And here you can see it's sort of a medium texture. It doesn't look as fine as that lava rock. There's definitely big chunks of stuff in there. However, because it was originally flatter, it came out of some of the like rock strata or like um, a crack or a fissure. I was able to pull it out between two layers of rock. That's why it's flat top and bottom, which is really helpful. And because it's just soft enough that I was able to grind it flat, you ended up with these much better numbers. I'll show the numbers that we ended up for from sharpening the 1095 on these different types of materials here. And I think really my one of my key takeaways or the thing that was the most counterintuitive or surprising about this particular episode is that I had experienced before this with some of these stones sharpening steels into the 200s or 300s and actually ending up with an edge that I would call sharp. But I had trouble and I, I didn't. I failed to create a sharp edge on the SE6 with any of these stones. None of them got below 400 grams on the best machine, despite the fact that I know that that's possible. So that was a really interesting observation, but probably the big takeaway with regard to the stones is that flatness or flattenability is king if you're gonna actually do survival sharpening without a sharpening stone. If you can grind two rocks together and make it flat, or if you can get a rock that's mostly flat to begin with, not curved, um, but, but flat, that you are gonna get better sharpening results the flatter you can achieve because you'll just be damaging the edge less and the edge direction and shaping will be in a predictable way and more consistent across the edge so that you can get rid of burr. This brings us to episode seven, which is the last episode that will have aired about my survival sharpening. And what I did in this is I took the eight different kinds of steel from the impact test, all of those knives, I dulled them on a Falcon Even CC4. Each time I tried to sharpen them on a rock and I took the best performing sharpening media, which was this piece of shale. I took a piece of crystal kind of quartz and like tried to make a little slurry on top of this stone with the fine structured kind of crystal material. Then sharpened on this piece of shale, the eight different knives at the same angle, all in the same way, and stropped them on my leather belt, making the allowance that, hey, if you're out surviving, there's probably a chance that you have a piece of leather on you, be it a wallet or a belt or whatever. If not, I found in my previous testing you can use bark, but we'll get to that later. Really the key takeaway from taking this stone, which sharpened 1095 the best in the other test, or I guess rather the second best, because the piece of crystal sharpened the 1095 to 485, 
but it was so round, I couldn't produce consistent results on it. So I decided to go with a piece of shale with some of that crystal abrasive kind of like ground into it in the form of kind of like a slurry. And ironically though, this is the best rock I have found to sharpen SE 1095. SE 1095 gave the worst sharpening result of all eight of the steels, which is really counter to the argument that I've heard that this is the reason why we use 1095. Another really counterintuitive thing is that for the most part, those same steels that were taken to a high level of hardness, like up in the 62 to 63 Rockwell range, actually performed super well sharpening them on rocks out of rivers and from mountains and from outdoors. I'm surely not qualified to make like total observation assumptions about it, but if I had to guess about what's happening here, it would seem that our assumption is that you go above 61 Rockwell and steel becomes too glass-like to be productive, like too prone to chipping. But it would seem in this test that actually the hardness is beneficial to a survival sharpening. And I would assume that that's because it changes the shearing mechanics of the steel, which is to say, as you're grinding away a new edge, if you are out surviving outdoors, you're, you're creating a burr and you have very, very limited resources to remove that burr. And when you go back and forth, even when you can't feel the burr, sometimes there are feather or foil burrs present that bend over, break off, that limit the sharpness that you can achieve. Therefore, a highly ductile steel that can be moved around and bent really easily, which is to say often a steel in the lower Rockwell hardness ratings, like 56, 57, 58 Rockwell, will actually be more difficult to sharpen in the field because when you're sharpening with a rock that's not made with uniform abrasive size, that's not made to sharpen knives, this thing is not kind to your steel and it will move a lot of metal in a really unpredictable and messy way. And steels which form less burr end up sharper because you don't have a good way to remove burr if you're out survival sharpening. Of all the knives that were tested, the clear winner is Nitro V. And I would assume that well heat treated AEBL or 13C26, 14C28N, 12C27 would also carry some of these good characteristics, these really homogenous, what they call eutectoid steels that are in that 0.7, 0.8% carbon and finely tuned chrome so that the carbides are really, really tiny will perform well, I think, in a survival sharpening scenario, simply because of uh, the carbide structure and the grain structure and the characteristics of the toughness versus the abrasive resistance characteristics of them being the most beneficial to sharpening if you have really rudimentary or primitive gear to use to sharpen them. Nitro V, the 63 Rockwell Nitro V that I sharpened was not just the best, like it was the best by a good margin to the extent that it returned a reading of 171, which is one of the lowest, if not the lowest that I've ever received off of one of these rocks. It was shaving my arm hair from a rock, like from a piece of shale that I grabbed in the Kaimai Mountains here in New Zealand which is insanity. Because of that, I totally have to give Nitro V the highest marks for this particular test where we sharpened all the steels on rocks. I'll put the average best readings of each particular steel on screen now so you can observe. You can see that Nitro V actually takes the test by about 100 grams best above everything else. But within everything else, there are small incremental decreases in how finely these various steels sharpened. I would divide them roughly into a couple groups. Nitro V is kind of in its own category here as like ideal for sharpening with primitive instruments. And then I'd say there's this mid group. It's probably from 10V and PGK and S35VN down to MagnaCut. 
They're all in the 300s. Now, PGK and 10V are a lot better, and 3V is almost as good as them. So S35VN and Magna Cut are on the tail end of that. But anything under 400 grams has a working edge. So these steels actually attained a fairly functional level of sharpness from a rock. To be in the 300s is a really good result if you look at my testing overall with trying to get things sharp on a rock. To be in the 300s is much better than it could be. The other group that you can see is clearly formed is the above 400 grams best average blades. That is Vanitas 4E at 438 and SE 1095 at 538. I would say these two collectively are in the category of not very sharp. Do they have a working edge that you could get by with? Yes, probably so. When I would grind these things flat on the diamond stone so that they were actually dull, I'd do three passes and they were returning test results from about 990 up to like 1200. So well and truly dull. And from that standpoint, if you look at the SE and how it sharpened on the rocks, it lost roughly 500 grams. It got sharper by approximately half of the best rating. But that said, if you're going to be doing everyday tasks, a knife at 227 is going to feel significantly better than a knife that is in the four to 500 range of best. I've forgotten on the last few videos to post up links. So above my head, you will see links appear for these last few videos that I have talked about coming on in order. So that's a broad stroke summary of the research that I've done in this area so far. I say research relatively lightly. I'm aware that there's a lot of variables and nothing that I've done is without any skepticism or chance of being wrong. There's definitely chances of variables not being completely and entirely fair. And I would hesitate to say that this is the final word on any of this stuff. It's just maybe the first word. Maybe this will inspire some other people to do some quantitative testing to figure out whether these assumptions that we hold are real. And maybe some of that will agree with what I've done, or maybe some of that will add to, and I'll get a new perspective. And that would be cool as well. My disclaimer, because we're about to go into the section where I make sort of recommendations. My disclaimer in all of this is I am not a survival expert. Please, please do not make life and death decisions based on this fun data that I have pulled together. I don't want to be responsible for your decisions in a survival situation. I'm not a survival expert. I am a sharpener. I'm a sharpener with fairly good technique and fairly good operating knowledge about sharpening. In addition to that, I'd say I'm probably going to get a lot of disagreement comments in the comment section of this video and people saying like, Did, have you thought of this? Or these are reasons why this may not be valid. Or these are reasons why this is not precise enough. And I am totally open to and accepting of disagreement. Like, sure, like, if, if I'm wrong, that's totally fine. Like, I haven't set out with a particular goal to prove in this test. I've just wanted to observe what happens with the blades that I have and the rocks that I have. But I would say this, if you're going to, like, qualitatively disagree with me, like, your research is bad and this is why it's dumb, then talk to me about the numerical or quantitative analysis that shows me that. Like, do your own research and present to me how the, the steel that you think to be best is actually best by some measurement other than word of mouth. That's what I would ask of people, and that would be my desire. I would be so happy if, if the whole knife community came back to me and was to prove me wrong out of doing their own research and, and having better research than mine. I think that would be really cool, and we would all learn through that process. So, by all means disagree, but please do so out of like logical, reasonable stuff. Okay, having said those disclaimers, what kind of stone would I say would be good to look for if you found yourself without a sharpening stone and in a situation where you needed to sharpen? Well, the first thing that I will say is that probably the level of sharpness that you need is not what we all strive for in this hobby. Like, you don't need to be whittling hairs, you know? You just need to be whittling wood. <laughs> but 
That said, I would say the most important thing according to the things that I have found is a stone that wears away metal that is flat. Flatness, flatness, flatness above everything else. I would go for a stone that is grindable and flattenable against another stone over a stone that has a much, much finer like structure and could produce a much, much finer edge if you got it just right. I have found the flat, the flattest stone you can get is going to be the most useful in all of the research that I've done so far. You'll notice between the worst and the best ones that I tested, the best one is flat and it's flat on both sides so you can hold it and really predict what that angle is going to do and you could set it on a surface and really dial in what you're doing with your knife which is what it takes if you're going to get something really really sharp in my experience so the number one type of stone or place that i would be looking if i was in a survival situation is you know you go on hikes and there sometimes will be an exposed rock wall and you can see the lines of the rock there and there'll be some types of rock or like shale type things that kind of crumble out. Look for the strata in the rock that are very straight. What I pulled this out of was I was walking along in a hike and I saw some of those lines in the rock and even my three most effective sharpening stones, I, I harvested them all this way. You find those really straight lines and then there'll be areas where some shift has happened or a piece is stuck out and it's eroded with water and some of them are a bit crumbly or a bit loose and sometimes you can pull a rock out from the strata there and then observe how flat the top is. If you could find two of those and rub them together until they're actually flat, you have a high chance of getting a good sharp edge that would help you in a survival situation. So that is my number one recommendation. Number two, I would say if you're not in a place where rocky outcroppings are super common, but you find yourself stranded or wanting to sharpen from stones, you need to probably look for some kind of river rock or sedimentary rock. What I mean by that is there's rocks that are not one solid block of stone, but they're sort of a collection. Your sandstone kind of things would fall into this category and a lot of rocks that you run into on a riverfront are sort of porous or maybe a softer quality and they've been rounded by tumbling. The sedimentary rocks can often be flattened quite easily because they're oftentimes a little bubbly or like open structure or they're a little bit kind of like a more of a clay, like a hard clay sort of texture. And that's what I found with this one. And it worked adequately, especially because if you rub two of them together with water, it creates a muddy kind of slurry, which sort of softens the action of the rock on the knife edge. And if you sharpen with one of these that you're able to flatten a part of it effectively, and then you work up a little bit of slurry, as long as there's not a big piece of grit tumbling around on top of there that's gonna damage your edge every time you pass by, if you can get a fine enough slurry and a flat enough surface, that is my number two recommendation if you're not in an area that has rocky outcroppings. Usually you can find rocks uh, in ridges and mountains or close to water, they'll be exposed. So those are my sort of two recommended areas. My number three recommendation would be if you are along a coastline or something like that or perhaps a river and you can find a rock that is kind of white or looks sort of crystalline, uh, a crystal like a quartz or an agate or something like that. Oftentimes they're a really good fine edge finishing stone. The downside that I found is that most of the ones I've ever found in the last two years are all round and they're so hard that they're very, very difficult to rub flat. And so you can use those. They are effective. And I actually got the singular best reading on the SE from a piece of crystal. But I found in my other testing, it was so difficult not to ruin an edge with a stone that's really lumpy, bumpy, or round that it didn't end up being worth it overall. That said, I did find the crystal kind of rock really useful for creating slurries that were sort of a uniform coarseness. So if you rub this sedimentary rock on this piece of shale, it will break loose large and small pieces. But when I use the crystal rock, 
to uh, grind up a little bit of dust or slurry, like wet slurry on here, to aid in the gentleness of the sharpening. When I did that, it pretty much broke off all pieces of the same size because of its sort of structure. It made this really fine paste on there, which was useful and which was the thing that got the Nitro V shaving sharp. And it was the thing that I sharpened all eight of those steels on to get those numbers in the 300. So for whatever that's worth, there you go. On the not so good side of things, I found that shells, oyster shell, clam shell, they can wear away the steel with those calcium structures, but it wasn't quick enough or aggressive enough to really accomplish a meaningful amount of edge repair in most of my testing. I also found that shells can be difficult because most often they're not flat. Most often they're domed in some rounded shape and ridged. And so your knife kind of skips along and it's really hard to be consistent with that angle. So I was thinking, oh, it'd be so nice if every coastline in the world, you could just find a shell and that would work for sharpening. But my research didn't show that to be the most wonderful option. Other things that seemed promising for sharpening in a survival setting, but ultimately turned out not to be of great benefit were pumice stone. I thought because pumice has this soft chalky feel to it, it might break down into a productive slurry or sharpen an edge pretty well because it'd be super easy to flatten. But in my experience, too large and sharp edged of pieces break off of pumice. It's kind of got this bubbly texture and it's got kind of like sharp edged structures that would break off and then it often wouldn't lead to a very fine edge. You could make an aggressive edge on pumice that was okay, but even refining it was difficult because it was so coarse. Also, these sort of lava rocks of different kinds that sort of look like they've kind of chipped apart from a bigger rock structure. I always thought, man, if I could just find one of these that like chipped off or broke off of the larger structure in a straight enough line, surely the hard and really fine texture of this would be great for sharpening. But in all of my looking over the last two or three years, I never found such a thing. This is the closest thing that I've come. And while it looks good, as we saw under the microscope, these transitions are much too abrupt and it's just, it's difficult to flatten. It's really, really hard. So I'm sure that if you took this to like a diamond stone or something like that and scraped it flat, that it, it might make a productive surface for sharpening knives. But that really nullifies the argument, doesn't it? Because if you had a diamond stone, you would just sharpen your knife on that diamond stone because any diamond stone would probably be better than any of, and easier than any of these rocks that I found out in the wilderness. In terms of what stropping materials would be best in a survival situation, I would say, hey, buy yourself a leather belt because a real leather belt, because obviously the best results that I got were from that when I allowed myself to include that in the results since I do indeed always wear a leather belt. However, if you did not have a leather belt and could not use unloaded leather to refine your edges, I found a thick piece of bark that I was able to grind flat. And I think that many kinds of wood, if you could split some and kind of like shave it or grind it a little bit flatter, that you could use thick bark or wood to some effect to strop clean an edge, especially when the flaky sort of texture from grinding is so rough off of these. Even the simplest of deburring methods can get some of that kind of really intensely shredded edge at times, especially if you've got a fairly coarse stone. It can help. It can help you to refine the edge. It can help you to get rid of a little bit of damage. I did find also that if you find you have a stone that has a really fine structure that's the best for creating a bit of a slurry on your stone, you can actually grind some of that slurry into your stone and then rub it into your bark or your wood and sometimes that can give you a better deburring effect because you sort of go over the same kind of rock particles and they dig away a little bit of steel but they're in this flexible wood and so they kind of like are cushioned a little bit and they hit a little bit more gently so they sometimes leave a little bit less burr. That's my observations about stropping. 
out in the bush. Now we come to the final question, which certainly everyone will want to know, probably now that you've done this bit of testing, in your opinion, what would be the absolute best type of steel to use in a survival knife, given all the criteria that you know of? Well, in that regard, I would say it's almost tempting to say, hey, CPM3V or even 10V did really amazing. Like in the impact chopping test at 250 strikes into the pine board, they were at the top of the list. Like halfway through the test, they were doing so well. However, by the 500 strikes mark, you could see that they had lost a little bit more sharpness. And I think it's hard to get around the fact that if you have chunks of carbide in your steel, that some teeny, teeny little micro chipping will cause that keen edge to go away, which is something that wasn't experienced in the Nitro V and in fact was somewhat less in the Magna Cut, strangely enough. However, CPM 10V and CPM 3V sharpened surprisingly well on River Rocks to they got back to a very surprising amount of sharpness considering their vanadium content or vanadium or whatever. <clears throat> Given all these characteristics, the good toughness, uh, the good edge retention, and the sort of medium low rust resistance, I'm gonna have to say CPM 3V and 10V, I'm comfortable kind of lumping together. I'm gonna have to give them the bronze medal. Third place overall. Now, Magnica is an interesting one because it has extremely high rust resistance. It has extremely high toughness. It has really good edge retention. And it was number one in the impact test pounding through that pine board, which is really, really impressive. And I have no lack of being impressed by Magna Cut as a steel and as an innovation. However, I was not able to sharpen it beyond about the 370 grams level of Bess on these rocks. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's the combined niobium vanadium content or what's going on there that's making it harder to sharpen, or if I made some slight error that produced a slightly less good edge at the spots that I best tested, which is also possible. But I'm gonna say that if this testing was consistent with my experience out in the woods, then I would have to say reaching only about 370 grams on the best machine, and that being sort of the ceiling of how sharp you can get it doesn't seem completely ideal to me. For Magna Cut, I'd say almost everything is there, but I have to give it the silver medal if we are going to include this survival sharpening on a rock data. I don't think a 370 gram ceiling of sharpness is ideal. Nitro V or similar steels in that, in that same category at a good level of hardness it has rust resistance, it has toughness, it has sort of medium edge retention, not as good of edge retention certainly as Magna Cut and some of the others, but very capable edge retention, more than 1095. It was number two close after Magna Cut in the impact test, and it was shaving sharp in the low 200s best off of a rock. It came off so much sharper than everything else I think I have to give Nitro V and similar steels the gold medal for what would seem at this point the best steel to put in a survival knife in a situation where you have no gear. So I just sort of like if this is the, you know, the uh, steel survival steel Olympics, then I've just sort of filled the podium. And I guess some of the people watching may be like, well, what do you make of 1095 then? Like, what do you make of 1095 after all of this? And I guess what I would say is that 1095 is still like a mid performer in my mind. Like, especially if you, if you have a sharpening stone, like then it, it, it does just fine. And it did really well in the impact test, considering all things, considering the price it is to get the steel and produce it. Um, and I would also note that steels like S35VN, 
didn't really perform significantly, significantly better across the board than 1095. I'd sort of lump it in with this, what I assume to be kind of soft Vanitas 4, and with high alloy, you know, S35VN, I would sort of lump it in the middle performer category with those other steels, which is not bad. I think you do face the fact with 1095 that if you're going to look at all the characteristics that steel can have, it's got very low rust resistance, it's got pretty low edge retention, very low in, at least in a Catra test. It's got mid to low toughness in your sort of charpy toughness testing. It's, it's below most of these other steels, not all of them, but, but many of them. And in my impact test with a baton on some pine timber, it was ranked number five out of the eight steels tested. So kind of there in the middle, just below the very middle. It should be noted that I've experienced some different characteristics from harder 1095. I've also experienced some different characteristics from different variants such as 1095 Crovan in my K-Bar Becker. For instance, the reading that I got in the survival sharpening for my Becker off of a worse stone than, than these ones was about a 409 and that's about 150 grams better than the SE Perform. So not all 1095s are the same. I'm sure if you were in a survival situation, you would eventually find a stone that could sharpen your 1095 enough to do the things that you need it to do. And I'm sure that an SE is a brilliantly designed survival tool that would help you in so many ways and be a totally like capable and good option. I do think that from my point of view as it is now, we have to reevaluate the discussion of this is the best because I don't think that I would really buy into a lot of this is the best because statements around 1095. I enjoy it. It's a good steal. I've had great experiences with it. I love some of the designs that are out in it. And in this testing, it performed low in some things, it performed decent in some things, and I would lump it somewhere in the middle. That's sort of my opinion on 1095. I may have made myself now just the least popular person in the knife world. I'm sorry, I just am trying to look at the data and come to some basic proposed conclusions. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this series with me. I hope that it helps you in your steel selection, or I hope that even some like manufacturers or custom makers end up watching this and that it provides valuable input to the current arguments and theories that are floating around the knife community. And I hope you all had fun. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to be down on anything just here to have fun comparing one thing against another and making observations. Anyway, if you're going to look at any of these tests uh, and you want to check out the one that I think is most interesting, I would recommend looking at the 4000 baton test where I took the eight different steels and baton them through wood because it was really fun and really interesting test. I'll put that on screen now. For the rest of you, I'll say peace out from the home slice. You guys take care. Bye.